Uh, here we have a single speaker who will be joining us. His name is Vikram Krishna and he's a multifaceted personality. He's a writer and editor, an industrial designer. He has served in Indian and multinational companies and focuses on media, technology and management practices. He is also a human rights activist and espouses the cause of personal privacy protection. He is better known for a model that he developed along with Arun Mehta on the request of Stephen Hawking. It's a free and open source software called Elocutor, better known as the Hawking Communicator, which helps to overcome natural language disabilities. Most importantly, he has something important to say on the subject of citizenship. Can we please invite Vikram Krishna on stage? Thanks very much. Um, it's really uh, wonderful to be here. At such an important, such an important event, and it's been wonderful coming here over the years to this event. So um, I thought it's been a little dry this morning. You know, a lot of talk and uh, big words and whatnot and all that sort of thing. So why don't we lighten things up with a bit of music? I hope this plays. <laughs> was very interesting because while I was looking at the audience I could see lots of light and there was lots of light because something didn't shut down that's the way it is you know we are beginning to take something for granted it's something that developed in India uh, for 40 years, before that we didn't have it and it has moved over the years into a more and more important and uh, basic role in our lives. So much so that at least 15 or 20 people, the moment the lights went off, the first thing they do is look at their phones to see if there's some problem they can sort out, if there's some information possibly that the phone will give them that will help them understand why the electricity has suddenly failed in the city where the electricity hardly ever fails. And you never experience any other kind of shutdown except when your phone stops working. <laughs> but this is not about phones working. What has happened now is that in the last 40 years, what was once a very inaccessible and very specialized little technology for a small handful of people became a commonplace technology in the 90s and even then it was commonplace only for a very small and we can call it unashamedly elite audience but then by the 2000s things changed remarkably and suddenly there was this struggle to crazily bring down the access costs and make it more available and suddenly this new device was invented which was an ordinary phone which had a computer built into it and that computer could handle data communications not just voice it was data communications and that data communications has over the years over these three decades become absolutely integral to most of our lives and Frankly, had it been most of our elite lives, I'd have said, oh well, so what? Lots of change in the world. Things keep happening all the time. But this change is different. This change is different because our government has taken it upon itself and not this current BJP government, but a government over a period of years. And we should understand that this has been happening very gradually over a period of years. They have been making it more and more necessary, mandatory, not voluntary, not optional. They have been making it necessary 
for you to get some of your critical business of being an Indian. They're making it necessary to use a computer digital network to do it. You can't, it's getting to the point where you can't walk into a bank and say, I am me, let me conclude my transaction with my bank account. I'm talking about you're already existing at the bank. Okay? Now, today, the bank doesn't want to see you. Sir, please use net banking. We have a digital authentication of who you are. Digitally, we have identified who you are. Throughout this morning, I've been listening to the very honest and very impassioned anger against the new last two decades set of laws that are changing the way we operate in this country. But you haven't heard one. Because that law was only passed in 2016. Although it affirmed an executive order from 2009. So when we see the dates, please understand, 2016, definitely the current BJP government, not the current one, of course, the previous version of this BJP government, and 2009, an order passed by the UPA cabinet. Okay? An executive order passed. It set up, you are no longer you, I am no longer me. Only my digital identity exists. This hasn't happened yet in India, but this is the frightening scenario they want. They want you to be effaced completely. They want you to, your identity to vanish and, tr and transform itself into a set of ones and zeros, which is to be your final affirmator of who you are. It's no longer about the nickname you were called as a child, the nickname you acquired when you went to school, the nickname you acquired when you went to college, the next way, nickname your best friend calls you, the nickname your children call you. All these are facets of our identity. The digital identity doesn't know any of them. So what has happened now really is that since the government has taken all this effort to put this infrastructure in place, and it is not yet in place, but it is happening around us slowly, like that tide they were talking about. You know, the tide which comes up very, very gradually when you're standing on a shallow beach, and slowly the water is coming up and covering your feet. And after some time you realize, and if you live in Bombay, of course you realize it because you go to the beach quite often, is that, you know, it's up to your knees and then it's up to your waist, and before you know it, you're trapped out there and you're having to call somebody to please save you from this awful tide. But unfortunately over here, there is no outsider who is going to save us from this awful tide, it is us. We have to do it. So one of the reasons I was called here, I think, is because I was lucky enough to uh, join hands with Ram Kumar and, uh, you know, several other people. And we actually filed a petition in the Supreme, well, we filed it in the Bombay High Court with another face, very familiar, uh, Mehir Desai was our lawyer. And he took us into the intricacies of the court. And we discovered how interested the High Court was in protecting our constitutional rights. Which is to say, they didn't give us a hearing for a couple of years. And when they finally heard us, it was an illegal hearing that had been specifically forbidden by the Supreme Court. Specifically, publicly, widely published. You shall have no hearing in India on this matter for the next six months. So what did they do? The Bombay High Court called a hearing. And they didn't just call a hearing, they issued an order to the UIDA telling them, why didn't you show up to the hearing? You're supposed to have submitted all this evidence in support. Come back with the evidence. Of course, they never came back because in the meantime, the court case moved very quietly to the Supreme Court and we, under Mir's advice, diplomatically kept silent and let it go to the Supreme Court. And where, as you know, we won a limited, very limited victory. That limited victory was that apart from the government, 
nobody else can utilize or what I would say abuse UID. But they did not say that the UID itself was unconstitutional. Despite the fact that plenty of evidence was given that the, the, the setting up of that uh, whole scheme was highly suspicious and had been conducted without proper due diligence. So that's, that's really a bad scene. So what has happened now today is we suddenly find that not only do we have the largest identification database in the world, we're even larger than all the big, uh, you know, uh, commercial companies that uh, seem so very popular and who are responsible, for instance, for the operating system of this phone, uh, another huge, gigantic, you know, trillion dollar company. And it turns out that, oh, guess what? Government of India has got a bigger record than that. It's got a almost 1.3 billion people inside a digital database. Almost. Because many of those numbers are fake. Many of those numbers can't be verified. And many people didn't register. So three things that happened. But the fact that so many things have been made have been necessitated and have been coercively told to people, you can do this, you have to do this. They don't tell you, the rules and laws don't say you have to do this. But they say you have to do this. So you do it. Why? Because it's your trusted banker who's telling you. So surely he must know the rules because I never ask the rules anyway. You expect somebody else to explain the rules to you. And then you finally discover that in 2019, there is so much of your daily lives that is quite, quite dependent on, not that you would be completely ruined without it, but it would be pretty difficult. And then what does the government do? The government says, you know what, in 1887, it was necessary for the British government to protect its telegraph lines because, guess what, even in 1887, some Indians didn't like the British as foreign rulers. So in 1887, the British government set up a rule protecting the telephone lines, the telegraph lines, and giving them a special status in India. And so 140 years later, we're taking the same act which we have not repealed, which we have layered over with a ridiculous information technology act in still numbered on paper 1998 actually passed in 2000. Such a bad act that it had to be such a badly drafted act that within six years it had to be amended. Guess what? And why I'm bringing this, why I'm even mentioning this act over here? It took two years for that act to be passed. And now I'll draw the connection. When we discussed what we were going to file in our case with Mehir, what are we going to talk to the judges about? What is it we're going to object about? Because we've got this much to object about. So what should we focus on? And Mehir said, please don't talk about technology. They don't understand technology. If you talk about the technology, your case will fail. But guess what? It was Nehru who said that this country should develop a scientific temperament. He ensured the pieces were put in place so that the IITs were built. It was supposed to bring the scientific temperament. Instead, what are we seeing? And this is what we are actually seeing around us. That the technological decisions are being made by a bunch of people who don't understand technology at all. The discussions around our sociology and politics are being made by people who refuse to discuss technology. In a country which is supposedly also, by the way, has the most engineers in the world. Absolute numbers, not percentage. Okay. And all that knowledge is not being used in ourselves 
looking after ourselves. Because we have a handful of people in parliament who actually have some awareness of science and technology. Our earlier pattern of putting, you know, great achievers into the Rajya Sabha seems to have sort of moved aside to putting film stars into the Rajya Sabha. And we don't actually have a rigid process for drafting laws by which laws can be made strong, constitutionally powerful, and things that will take us forward into a country that we can actually be proud of. So that's hugely missing. I do not know why it's missing. I don't understand it. I do know that it is very, very common to get a common reaction from people. You know, let's not talk about the technology. But if you don't talk about the technology, then you won't realize why the technology is supporting an oppressive and coercive regime. And do not think it is the politics that is doing it. It is the technology that is making it possible. If that technology didn't exist and if it wasn't used this way, this would not be happening. We would not be worrying about this situation at all. And we wouldn't care about something called internet shutdowns. What has happened in internet shutdowns? Kashmir has been shut off for nearly six months. It's an absolutely ridiculous state of affairs. Last week, a tiny amount of, no, this week, I think, a tiny amount of, you know, space was opened up. One telecom service provider, whom we hardly need to name since he's the richest man in India, <laughs> is given the limited ability to run a 2G network in Kashmir. Oops! He doesn't run 2G networks. It's not in his service offerings. So you allowed him to operate a service which he doesn't operate. He doesn't have the equipment for and he doesn't have any ability to operate it in Kashmir. That's the situation we have today in India. Was this deliberate? Who knows? Or is it just somebody in the ministry who's too stupid to realize that there's no point giving him this benefit, he can't use it. And there's no point embarrassing the government by giving him this benefit which the other two guys have not been given. And why are there only two guys? Why is this problem, why is this country left in a situation where we have only three service providers for a country which is one of the, you know, third or fourth largest in the world and certainly one of the second highest population in the world and we have only three service providers? And they're all national? And we can't figure out any better way to do it? A country with the largest number of engineers in the world doesn't have the technological get-go to work out a telecom system which is highly distributed, highly widely owned, highly robust, highly difficult to make fail. Make fail. When do you make something fail? You make something fail when you do not want it to work properly. You want to work it only as your tool. It's not a tool for the people to communicate. I've been in communications now, you know, just the telecom side of it, 20 years. That's a long time to discover what government of India doesn't like. Because it's legion what it doesn't like. Anything that empowers, it doesn't like. When, in the 90s, when the first cyber cafes were starting, do you know that in this state, in Maharashtra, the police used to go and arrest cyber cafe owners? There was no law which allowed them to do that. None. But they used to seize the equipment and shut down the cyber cafes. And they started this ridiculous system of you giving your name and address in order to use a cyber cafe. Who uses a cyber cafe largely enough? People who can't afford their own computers or who don't have a phone that gives them that service. That was the birth of the cyber cafe revolution all over the world, except India. India, it was dashed inconvenient to use a cyber cafe. And what was the purpose? Because you might get the occasional terrorist to send an email in plain language to an open email ID giving his own name you know 
you might be able to catch that terrorist. <laughs> so, we've actually had a situation where things have been really, really bad. Do we have two minutes? Okay. Two minutes for questions or two minutes for... Two minutes for... <laughs> so, I just wanted to bring up the last case. The last case was Delhi. You see, unlike Kashmir, where the grayness about the orders is more than normal because the case filed in the Supreme Court did not get the basic result, which was government turn over your orders right now. Instead, they said, you can turn over your orders. You should turn over your orders. You should make them public. That's what the order says. It doesn't say when. So it hasn't happened yet. But Delhi was different. Delhi, you have a policeman from the special cell taking it upon himself to issue an order which has enormous financial implications about the people you're giving that order to. Are they your servants? Are they government servants? No. They're private companies. You're not allowing them to operate their services. Okay. So here's some number from the Guardian. I don't know where they got it from. Uh, Indian mobile operators lose about 24.5 million rupees, 2.5 crores in revenue every hour that they are forced to suspend internet services. Another report from CNBC here, researchers estimated this is the year that India became the internet shutdown capital of the world. <laughs> researchers estimated a total loss of 1.3 billion dollars, that's 93 crore rupees in my calculation, for India as a result of internet shutdowns, but they say this is only a low guess. We think it's much more. So here we have this country talking about industry and vikas and this and that and the other and what we actually have a situation is where we've all been moving along with this tide of digitization we now have a situation where the government says not so fast let's shut you down and that's what they've done so uh, i just want to uh, say really over here that while i mentioned 1887 the rules did get updated, they, get, they got updated in 2017. The government now has a second rule by which it can shut down the internet. And guess what? As I'm reading from the various case papers, it becomes clear that nobody told the police. So the police are still using the two rules. The one, the patently illegal section 144, which was never meant to be used for internet shutdowns, and two, the, what is, Charmingly called Network Suspension Rules of 2017. Thank you. Yeah, sure, we should take questions. Um, please have a seat, sir. Uh, we open the floor for questions. We have only time for two questions. Um, those who would like to ask questions, please raise your hands. Our volunteers will get the mic to you. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, I want to ask. My name is Yash, and uh, I want to know how, what is how does China compare to India regarding internet and surveillance? The second question to my right. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. My name is Zakir. I am a journalist, and I would like to bring. The present scenario, what is going on in India specifically? We are staying in a world where we are completely going down. By looking at the present scenario, especially in the Asian countries, we are bound with the caste system. If you want to win the election, if you want to rule the country, then you should say Pakistan chore. And we should give some bad words to the people community. You are surely going to win the election. That is yeah. what I said before the election in the uh, press club of Bombay. Could you please uh, uh, tell us your question? So now the situation has come where 
सिस्टम ऑफ फंक्शनिंग एज वन वेर सम ऑफ द ब्राइटेस्ट माइंड एंड सम ऑफ द मोस्ट एबल एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर सेट टूगेदर फॉर थ्री ईयर्स एंड क्रिएटेड अ डॉक्यूमेंट विच इज मेंट टू बी दू नो द मेन स्टे ऑफ दिस कंट्री एंड वी ऑल लाइक दैट डॉक्यूमेंट विद इट्स वॉट्स एंड पिंपल्स वी स्टिल लाइक इट बिकॉज वी थिंक दैट it's certainly better than a lot of other countries you, you heard the uh, when she was introducing me she mentioned my interest in privacy in america do you know uh, sorry i won't go on about china because china has got the tiktok example but let's not look at look at tiktok let's look at what happens in america in america it is illegal for the police to investigate your digital life it is illegal you need a court warrant you need a lot of special supporting uh, uh, you know endorsements from other organs of the state the police can't do it alone and yet a private company can go to facebook and take all that information without any permission at all and the reason is that america does not have a constitutional right to privacy india has a constitutional right to privacy america is the most litigious country in the world if people are annoyed they go to court india has a lot of court cases but guess what most of them 67% i believe are filed by the government the aam janta does not go to court the result is the aam janta does not actually object to what is being done and thank god for it because i think our courts are already terribly clogged and if we started going to to the court we would be probably facing even worse problems than we are facing right now but uh, that's that's just a side comment of mine the truth is that we do not actually take the government to task sufficiently in all the ways possible so what are we left with we left with shayin bag and thank god that's not a polarized at all i sincerely believe it is not a polarized form of protest at all thank you very much sir